everybody, let's clap tonight.
Somebody shout hallelujah. Here we go. Sing for the lost. Sing for the least. The weak, the poor. Let victory song. Let victory song. Sing heaven's praise. waiting on the Lord to return. We wait for you. Thank you, Lord. Wait for you. We long for your return. Come on, lift your voice. You can say it again. We bless you and love you. Amen. Come on, let's say this. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the dark. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise.
tell him right now how great he is. S sing that one more time. One, one more time. Great Just in your own way. You, great are you, Lord, in your own way. Whatever day you had, doesn't matter. Whatever week you're having, whatever year you're having, great is all God Almighty, our Lord Jesus Christ, who we're here to serve. So just tell him how great he is for 10 seconds. Just how great he is to you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Praise you, Lord. Well, you can have a seat. Welcome to Turning Point Church on a wonderful Wednesday night, right after Labor Day. You know what the day after, after Labor Day, what all that means, right? You're not supposed to wear white anymore. Just saying, just mess with you. Um, so welcome to Turning Point Church. Really glad you're here. Uh, we've got so many great things coming up in this church right now. I just want to talk about a few of them. Uh, Heels and Man Church will begin meeting again on this Monday night. So come to that, men and women. It's going to be a great time. Uh, Majoring in Men begins tomorrow night along with Kingdom Women. Two great, great ministries I promise you, you do not want to miss. And we have a great video about servanthood after this, uh, the offering. But who, who wants to serve the Lord? Who loves to serve the Lord? Raise your hand. Amen. Well, it just so happens that after the service tonight, we have a way you can serve the Lord. We need people to help us move paper, literal paper, from the fellowship hall back to the print room. So if you have, uh, many hands make light work, right? So if you have five, ten minutes to spare for the Lord, come on now, um, we would greatly appreciate your help after the service tonight. So it's going to be a really great time. You know, when you serve God, it's, it's just fun. No matter what you're doing when you're serving the Lord, you're serving a higher purpose. You're getting to lay crowns at the feet of Jesus Christ himself one day, and that's what you do it for. That's why we serve God in the many different ways that we serve him. Amen? Well, one of the ways we serve him is through our tithe and offering. So as we get into Matthew chapter 15, Jesus said to them, to the disciples, how many loaves of bread do you have? And they said, seven loaves and a few little fish. And he took seven loaves and the fish, and he gave thanks. Now, we all know what he did with that, right? He multiplied it exponentially and fed about 10,000 people. Imagine 10,000 people there, and he fed every single person. He feeds us every day of our lives. The disciples gave to Jesus the little they had, and he multiplied it exponentially out of the little they had. So it doesn't matter how much you have to give. If you give it to the cause of Christ, he can use that in ways you cannot comprehend, right? So we give out of our insufficiency to God's sufficiency. Jesus will bless everything we have. Now, in this church, we have many ways you can give. One of them is they're going to pass the buckets. Uh, the easiest way is just get your old cell phone out, 817-617-4378. And you can give online. I think I missed a number there, but that's okay. Um, it's up there. So you can give online. It's real easy, or we have the offering stations in the back. You can just give that too. So let's pray over the offering as you give. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come boldly to your throne room tonight, God. We know that you're the God of the universe, the God of all eternity, and we give to you freely everything that we have, Lord. We give our lives to you. I pray that every cent given here tonight is blessed by you, that Turning Point Church can go to the entire world and literally be the example of a, how a church operates and gives to you, Lord, who puts you first in servanthood and everything that we do, the entire world, Lord. We just thank you so much, God. We just love you and we praise you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So again, there's many ways you can serve in this church. We have so many different ministries that are available here. So don't just come on Wednesday and Sunday, sit down. They're great messages, but, but get involved. If I would have never got involved, my life would have never changed for the Lord like it did. And when you get involved and serve God, A, it's fun, like I said, and you're just going to grow in the Lord. You're going to get more involved and more involved and more involved. So we have a great video we're going to show you tonight about the Serve Timber. Amen. Hi, I'm Darren. I'm Hillary. And we work as greeters. Uh, we really enjoy working at the south entrance and seeing everybody as they come in. I think it really helps that giving them a smiling face and an introduction and welcome as they get here uh, to kick off their morning uh, as, as they enter the house of God. And I really have loved the opportunity it's given us to get to meet a lot of the people that we wouldn't necessarily see um, just going to service. 
I think it's been a blessing to us and being able to, to meet all those people um, and be the first thing that they get to see. Uh, so I think that's a blessing to me. Hopefully it's a blessing for them as well. Just out of gratitude for what he's done for us and in so many different places, it seems like such a minimal response to be able to just greet. It's such, it takes so little time and I feel like we get to reap all the benefits. Everyone starts volunteering and coming together uh, for the events and it feels like uh, you become a family. All right. Wait a minute, there they are. <laughs> Y'all stand up with me. I'm expecting a call from America's Got Talent anytime now. Amen. You know, you really, you're missing a huge part of the Christian experience uh, if you're not serving somewhere, doing something. It's called good works. So uh, we're gonna be making all kinds of possibilities available for you this week so that everybody can plug in. You know, when I got plugged in to just doing whatever I could do in the place where I was worshiping, that is when God got to me and called me to preach, when I was just serving. And the first thing anybody ever gave me to do was lead a little Bible study out back, or not a Bible study, but a prayer meeting out back of this house where we were meeting to have Bible study. And about five, six people would get out there with me and pray and that's where it all started. And before I knew it, they were tapping me to teach. And it terrified me. <laughs> but I did it. And that was the beginning. So, amen. God is good. I want to say how much I appreciate Jonathan peeling the paint off the wall Sunday, doing a great job preaching. Yeah. I wanted Jonathan to have a chance to push the one conference and... Uh, also, just to share the word, and I know that it went well. And he said, well, where were you? I was with my little mother, my little 98-year-old. And she doesn't mind me saying, so do you, mother, right? She's probably watching. And, um, but she's 98, no arthritis, no cancer, no heart disease, no dementia, no nothing. Yeah. Her schedule, her calendar would wear you out. And she just... You know, hustles around inside that, that place where she lives on her little walker and everybody knows her and loves her. And you should see how many cards she gets just for her birthday. I need five years of life to get as many cards as she gets in just one birthday. She's everybody's friend. So that's my little mother. So we were with her and my sister from Houston and I had to do a couple other things. And anyway... I'm glad that it went well, and it's good to be with you, all of you. Now, we're coming to the end of the book of Revelation. Can you believe it? Can you? That we've been through, do you know how many weeks it's been? Ready? 20. Amen. You're acting like that hurts you. No, it's been really good. So, we're, we're going to uh, tonight and then next Wednesday, I believe, will be the last one. We're looking at the new heaven and the new earth tonight. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your goodness, for this incredible book, from your book, this last book in the scriptures. Lord, thank you that the end is coming, but with that ending comes a brand new world. And we just praise you and thank you for illuminating the word to us tonight, teaching it to us, and helping us to understand it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Turn to your neighbor and tell him Jesus is coming back. <laughs> Amen. Now, uh, just a little recap. I'm, I'm going to do a pretty lengthy recap because we've been through so much information. Can I have an amen? amen? A lot of information. So I'm going to recap a little bit. But last time we closed with the visible return of Jesus Christ to the earth. And what does he come back to do? He comes back to stop the great war of Armageddon and usher in his millennial kingdom. Now the Lord Jesus is going to rule the world out of Jerusalem. And the saints of God, and that is us, the church 
will rule with him. Now you may not know that or understand that, but I'm going to show you tonight. Jesus said it. I'm going to read it to you now. Matthew 25, 23. Jesus said, well done, good and faithful servant. How many of you want to hear that? He said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful and trustworthy over a little. Now look what he says next. I will put you in charge of many things. Another version says, make you ruler over much. And then share in the joy of your master. Now the context here is these people he's addressing or, you know, who he's talking about are those entering into eternity entering into their reward. The race is over. So he's saying, well done. And notice, when you step into eternity, then he says, I'm going to make you a ruler over much because you were faithful over a little. So it tells us faithfulness here brings great reward there. Amen? Amen? So what are we going to rule over? I don't know. But it's going to be neat. I know it's going to be good. But that's all he tells us. And yet, I know this, God is a God of blessing, and it will be a, uh, an incredible thing to experience. Now, we've arrived at the end of John's revelation. And so before wrapping it up tonight and next week, I want to briefly do a quick sweep of what we have learned. All right? So let's just do a little catch up and bring all this together. The revelation is primarily concerned with the final seven years of history as we have known history. And it's called the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation, the trigger for it, will be Israel cutting a peace treaty with Antichrist, who they believe to be an incredibly gifted man of peace. That's what they believe about him. He's a fake and a phony and a counterfeit. And he's going to come on the scene like he's Dudley Do-Right. And he's to, to bless everybody and to, to bring world peace and harmony and unity and all that good New Age stuff. But he's really the devil in disguise. And he's the most demon-possessed man. He, I believe he's the only man in all of history that the devil will fully, consummately possess. Take the Gadarene demoniac, out of whom came legions of demons, Mary Magdalene, out of whom came seven demons. This guy will be Satan incarnate. Now, he doesn't come from a virgin birth or anything like that, but he's satanic head to toe, inside out, every atom of his being. He'll be controlled and, and animated by Satan. So, but he's going to come on the scene. Let, let me broker a peace deal, a peace deal between Israel and the Arabs, and he will succeed. And everybody will, will hosanna him. And in this guy, incredible. Wow, what a savior. What a, what a, what a, what a guy. What a man of peace. What a blessing he is and oh they just don't know now once he does that the seven years i believe begin as the tribulation progresses john reveals three sets of judgments are going to fall upon the christ rejecting world we know what they are they are the seven seals the seven trumpets and the seven bowls god seems to like seven right seven days of creation i mean you can go through so many sevens in the bible but he's going to pour out judgments in increments of seven. As I read the Revelation, it seems to me they get worse with every set of seven. The seal judgment's terrible, but not quite as bad as the trumpet judgments. They're terrible, but they can't hold a candle to the seven bowls. It gets worse. So 21 in all. They are devastatingly impactful, they destroy Earth's ecology. They wipe out a third of mankind, a third of vegetation, and a third of marine life. As a great appreciator of God's creation, that hurts me to read it, but I know that it's got to be. 
in spite of all these judgments, man is going to remain completely and totally unrepentant. The more you read through the book of Revelation, the more you realize just how ripe that final generation is for judgment. Because with all of this going on, they do not once look up and say, I repent, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have sinned against you and brought all this on our world. I, forgive me. No, not once. Instead, they lift their fists to God and curse and blaspheme him, which to me is crazy. But that's what they do. Meanwhile, Antichrist has a little sidekick, his own little John the Baptist, if you will, in an evil sense, called the false prophet. Antichrist will be a political ruler, false prophet will be a religious ruler, a religious pers uh, persona, pers a person. And, and, and he will help establish a worldwide rule. The Antichrist will use this false prophet, who I think could very possibly be something like a pope. I don't mean if anybody uh, from a Catholic background, I really don't. But who has the ear of the world in a religious sense more than a pope? I mean, he speaks, and it's almost like E.F. Hutton. Everybody listens except me. I don't listen. But a lot of people do. The Antichrist is going to use this false prophet and a harlot, apostate, new age, super church, the false prophet will lead to convince the world that he's indeed the answer to all their problems. This false prophet will point to Antichrist like John the Baptist pointed to Christ. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist said, false prophet will say, Behold the answer to your problems, the great fixer, the great end-all in political rulers. And he will point to him and exalt him and promote him. The false prophet will even perform miracles, all the while pointing to the Antichrist, much like John the Baptist pointed to Christ. He'll call fire down from heaven, the Bible says, in book of Revelation. He will literally do something to call fire out of heaven. So who's he acting like there? Who's he, who, who are people going to think of when they see that? Elijah, the prophet of fire. He'll call fire out of heaven, and it will be, people will really see it. It will be a delusion. They'll see it. And then he'll say, I'm the real deal. I'm of God. Now follow him. I believe this is the great delusion Paul talks about in Thessalonians when it says because they didn't receive the love of the truth, God will send them a strong delusion that they would believe the lie, not just any lie, but that little the in front, the definite article, that means the Holy Ghost is setting aside this delusion to be totally unique, all of its own, and beyond other delusions and other lies. The lie, not a lie, but the ultimate lie. And I think that ultimate lie is Antichrist. He'll point to him. It's not here, but we read where the whole world will worship him. They'll bow down to him, they'll pursue him, and they'll sign up for his beast system. The false prophet will, at the behest of Antichrist, install a one world currency and an economic system that requires receiving a mark on your forehead or on the back of your hand, or you can't buy or sell or function in society. You won't be able to buy a tank of gas at the 7-Eleven without having the mark of that beast. So we can see that Revelations tells us the world is racing toward worldwide socialism. I'm not saying you should just lay down and let it happen. But when you got one person or, or a duo, Antichrist false prophet, and their government requiring that everybody get a certain mark on the whole earth, that's socialism. We can also assume it'll be a cashless society. You won't use money anymore. You'll use that mark. You'll go through the store. You'll go through the ticket counter to get into a, a game. You'll go into the clothing store and 
you'll wipe your hand across or underneath a scanner and it will read it and immediately withdraw the money from your account that you've never seen because you don't need it because you've got the mark. So it'll be global socialism and a cashless society. I ask you, do you see it now beginning to take shape? How often do you use money? How often do you use money? The other day I went through Chick-fil-A and without even thinking, I whipped out a card for a Chick-fil-A. So I got me a chicken sandwich, a milkshake. <laughs> they have the best milkshakes in the whole city. I'm just letting you know. All right? And, and, um, and I gave them a card because I said to myself, it's so much easier. I don't have to mess with the change. That's where the whole thing's going to go. Marks have already been instituted, chips under the hand, various things that may or may not be what this will ultimately be, but I can tell you the Greek word, when it says mark, it's the, the Greek word for tattoo. It's, it's a tattoo-like um, something on your hand or your forehead. Could, could it be a chip underneath? I don't know. But it will be, to me, when I read it, just straight Greek, when I read it, and I see the, the Greek word, it's... it's clearly visible mark like unto a tattoo. Maybe it's invisible unless it comes under a scanner. Don't know. But I do know it's coming. Whoever receives this mark of the beast will be damned. Whoever refuses the mark is going to be persecuted and many will be martyred. There will be many people saved during the tribulation period. We talked about that. Uh, there's going to be 144,000 Jewish men who are going to be commissioned by God to preach the gospel throughout the world, resulting in a huge tribulation harvest. For the first three and a half years, there'll be peace with the Jews and the Arabs. Everybody will be kumbaya, in everything great. Per the Antichrist peace treaty, the world will believe they have achieved peace at last. You know the verse, when they say peace, peace, then comes sudden destruction as unto a woman in travail who's about to give birth to a child. Not a thing she can do about that travail. All she can do is give birth. But at the halfway point, Antichrist, three and a half years in, will show his true colors. He'll walk through the re, uh, uh, into the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. It will be rebuilt. He'll go into the Holy of Holies, the holy place where the Shekinah glory used to dwell and declare himself to be God. He will literally say, I am God. And the Bible calls this the abomination of desolation. He will desecrate the Holy of Holies that is the Holy of Holies because of God's Shekinah glory that manifests within it. Paul writes, for that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed. He's talking about Antichrist, the one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy every god there is. He'll tear down every object of adoration and worship. This is three and a half years in. He will say, nothing else is going to be worshipped but me. He will position himself in the temple of God, claiming that he himself is God. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 to 4. So there you go. The Jews will be shocked. And this will serve as the trigger to the second half of the Great Tribulation, which is really bad. Persecution will be immediately unleashed on the Jewish people and on all Christians. Jeremiah calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. It's sometime during the second half of the tribulation, a people that John calls the kings of the east will rebel against the Antichrist and unleash a 200 million man army to the valley of Megiddo for the great war of Armageddon. Now, to me, the kings of the east has to be primarily China. Because only China could come up with that size of an army. Now, 
He says in the verse I'm about to read, all the kings of the earth. So there will be various reasons for all the kings of the earth that will be included in this battle. The true reason is God brings them there. Verse 14, chapter 16, for they are the spirits of the demons sent by God. Now this is Revelation, we're going back a couple of chapters, but remember we studied this. They are the spirits of the demons sent by God, sent by who? God, performing signs who go out to the kings of the earth to bring them together for the battle that will take place on the great day of God, the all-powerful. So demon spirits are literally unleashed by God to bring this about. And some of you might be thinking, why in the world would God do that? Or how could God do that? Or Because this is judgment. You know what this shows us? You know what the book of Revelation shows us, among other things? That our God is a sovereign God. And when I say sovereign, I mean he is in charge of the whole earth, the whole universe, and even though it looks at times like he's not in charge of anything, he's actually in charge of everything. Okay? So men, you know, they fight. Satan attacks. There's evil. There's murder. There's bloodshed, rape, pillage, all these things. And yet, put it this way. If, if, you, if you got onto a cruise ship tonight, perk up, Johnny. Okay. He does more cruises than anybody I've ever known on earth. Um, he needs to become a captain of a cruise ship. But anyway, here's the deal. If you were getting on a cruise ship tonight, and, and, and you're a believer, you love Jesus, and you're, you're in this cruise ship, and you've got your little room, and you can't wait to enjoy this marvel. Let's say it's an Alaskan cruise, and you're out there in the ocean, you haven't been out there a day or two, and all of the... Uh, inhabitants of this cruise, all of the people on this cruise, begin just to act like terrible sinners. They start getting drunk. They start carousing. They start yelling. There's some violence on the ship. All these things begin to go on. And you, here you are, you're a spirit-filled Christian watching this, and you don't know what to do. And when you look at what's going on around you, Everywhere you go, it's partying and drunkenness and drugs and, you know, immorality and all these things. And, and you begin to wonder, what's going to happen to us? But then you go up the stairs into the cabin's law or captain's law. And there's the captain of the ship, and he is totally serene. He's totally calm. He's looking at instruments. And you say to him, Captain, they're going crazy on this ship. They're, they're acting crazy. They're at, they are sinning terribly. The captain very serenely says, it's okay. Because you see this? We've got a destination. And I'm going to get this ship to that destination. No matter what the passengers do, it's going to arrive on time, where I promised, the way I promised. And when we arrive, I'll take care of the passengers. Jesus is in the captain's law. And his sovereignty is guiding the ship called this world. And you look at it and you go, it's crazy, it's gone insane. But the captain's fine. He's serene. He's at peace. He's not worried. He's looking at the instruments. You know what the instruments are? His prophecies. I've, I've already laid out where we're going, when we're going, how we're going, where we're going to arrive at. And our destination is heaven. And he's going to get us there. Amen? All right. Now, the, all the kings of the earth come together to the Valley of Megiddo. Let's go along quickly. God also literally dries up the Euphrates River. We showed you a picture of that river. Uh, for this massive 200 million man army to cross on their way to the valley of Megiddo where the war of Armageddon will happen. I showed you where the valley of Megiddo is, I think, last time. And look what happens, Revelation 16, 12. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates and the water was dried up 
that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So God will dry it up like he dried up the Jordan, like he dried up the Red Sea. Verse 14 also reveals this movement as part of a worldwide gathering of the kings of the earth and of the whole world in order they might participate in the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So at the end of the tribulation, everybody, in a nutshell, there's going to be the mother of all wars. Of all wars. Nothing like it in the history of the world. Jesus said, if those days weren't shortened, not a human would live. No flesh would survive. But how is it stopped? Jesus comes back. Listen to what it says. He's going to return to the earth with his, with his raptured church to set up the millennial kingdom. And in so doing, he'll destroy the Antichrist and his armies with the glory of his coming. Here's Zechariah 14, verse 1. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations. As he fights in the day of battle. And on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley, with half of the mountains moving north and half moving south. Now, remember when Jesus ascended back into heaven? Where was he? Mount of Olives. What did the angels say when they were watching him go up? He said, this same Jesus who you've seen go up is going to come down the same way. And here's Zechariah, centuries before the angel told them that, saying when, when Messiah returns in his second advent, he's going to land on the Mount of Olives. And it's going to split north to south. And the judgment of the nations commences. What amazes me is that Antichrist and all the people that are there gathered for battle are going to decide to go to war against Christ when he returns in the clouds. Now that's insane. I told you this last time. But this is what's going to happen. Here they are. They're battling in the Valley of Megiddo. Valley, they're, they're battling the, this horrible war. And suddenly Christ appears in the clouds. Behold, every eye shall see him and those who pierced him. And what happens? They come together and they say, let's fight him. So they're psycho. If I'm seeing somebody in the clouds, I'm on my face. Lord Jesus, forgive me for every sin I ever committed. Not them. So the Lord returns. John reveals that at this time the Antichrist and false prophet are cast in the lake of fire. Let's read about it. How many of you are looking forward to that? Here comes the final judgment of all things. Then the beast, Antichrist, was captured. With him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who receive the mark of the beast and those who worship his image. These two, get this, were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Antichrist and the false prophet are the first two human beings to ever enter the lake of fire. And then the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, which is Christ, all the birds of the air were filled with their flesh. Now immediately following the greatest day, the devil is also cast into the abyss. 20, Revelation 20, verse 1. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old. Look at all the way he's, ways that John describes him. Dragon, snake, devil, Satan. He wants to be sure we know who he's talking about. And he bound him for a thousand years. He cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the, the nations no more. Now this marks the end of the tribulation and the beginning of Christ's eternal kingdom. I hope we, the church, are allowed to watch the devil get thrown in. I want to do cartwheels. I want to jump. I want to praise God. I want to shout for all the hellish misery Satan has done to human beings. The glorious millennial reign of Christ follows. With Satan bound and Christ ruling the world in righteousness, our bruised and bloodied planet experiences a thousand years respite. 
Isaiah describes this time. You've heard it, but it's great to hear it again. In that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion. And a little child will lead them all down a path. You know what it's telling us? All carnivorous predatory activity is gone. Now, I don't know what that does for you. I love it. I don't like seeing animals tearing each other up, eating each other. I don't like seeing all this violence and misery. It's all going to go away during the millennium. Everything goes back to eating vegetables. You better get ready. There's nothing. Hey, if you're vegan, you're only warming up. Because <laughs> if I'm reading this right, there's no more predatory carnivorous activity. All right? Here, here you got a wolf and a lamb laying down and taking a nap together. Whereas right now, the wolf would kill him in five minutes flat. Okay. War goes away. Isaiah writes, the Lord will mediate between nations and will settle international disputes. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer fight against nation nor train for war anymore. No more army, navy, marines, nothing. All gone. The millennium is going to be a time of peace, joy, and comfort. Amen? Bliss. Can you imagine no devil, no temptation? Can you imagine... No attack. Can you imagine? No more spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6 will become null and void. The Bible says at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ on earth, Satan is going to be loose from the abyss and will deceive the nations on the earth. Don't ask me why. That's in God's hands. But here's what will happen. Some will literally try to overthrow the throne of Jesus. Now remember, there's two kinds of people during the millennium. The rapture church that comes back with Christ, and they have glorified bodies. But those that enter the millennium out of the tribulation period will not have glorified bodies. They will marry, they'll be giving in marriage, they'll have children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, and it's those descendants of the folks that came out of the tribulation into the millennium, it's their descendants that are going to rebel against Christ towards the end of the millennium, and a judgment commences, and they are quickly judged. Don't want to dwell on it. I don't know why God's letting that happen. I'm not him. Now, following the millennium comes the terrible great white throne judgment. The judge sitting on the great white throne is none other than Christ himself. The millennium's done. A thousand years have gone by. A thousand years. Now there's a judgment seat, great white throne. Who's sitting on it? The Lamb of God. Who's going to judge the world? You're Jesus. <coughs> He's going to judge them. His face is so awesome that heaven and earth fled away, but could find no place to hide. Who's going to face him? All of the resurrected dead who rejected Christ in New Testament times and who rejected the life that they had in Old Testament times. Every human that ever lived is going to be brought before this throne. So what does that tell us? Every single person that dies in Christ or out of Christ will one day be resurrected. Okay? All of them. Millions, billions, billions of people, all of them, will be resurrected before Christ. Those that died lost as they could be are going to be resurrected. All of them. This tells us irrefutably that we are all eternal beings. We have an eternal soul. In some of the most sobering passages in the Bible, John writes these words, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. How are they judged? John says, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works. 
by the things which were written in the books. Now notice, there were books plural and a book singular. The plural books apparently contain the history of a person's life. You know, I think most of us don't stop to think that we're all watched. We are by God. Our life is recorded. All the decisions, every direction we take, everything we say. Didn't Jesus say, you're going to give an account for every word that comes out of your mouth? Well, well how? Because they're recorded. He, he's letting us know here there's going to be a day of reckoning. And, and our, our current culture doesn't want to hear that, but I'm going to tell you straight up, church, there's an awesome judgment coming. It's an awesome judgment. There, there's an awesome judgment coming. And you've either got the attorney God gave you, pro bono, his name is Jesus. And he's the only mediator. He's the only one that can get you past the judge into heaven. He's the only one that can deal with your sin issue and my sin issue. He's the only one. The book of life, singular, contains the names of those who died in faith. Now, not just in New Testament times, but in Old Testament times. Because the Old Testament saints believed God's word about a coming Messiah, and it was reckoned to them as righteousness. All right? It says in, in Hebrews 11, all these died in faith. All who? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the prophets, they all died in faith. Not having received the promise, what promise? Of a Messiah. God having provided some better thing for them for, through us. That is, when Messiah came, their faith in the coming Messiah and the forgiveness he offered was made retroactive towards them. So they were forgiven retroactively. Those of us who are on the other side of the cross, we're forgiven in the now. But when they saw Jesus coming, they said, I believe he's coming. They died in faith, not having received the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us could not be made perfect. But then Jesus came. So either Old Testament saints looking forward, New Testament saints looking backward, uh, those who die with faith in Christ, you're in the book of life. The book of life. You won't have to answer for your sins. You will not have to say, go before God and say, well, yeah, you know, I'm watching the film of my whole life. This is your life. And wow, I messed up there and there and there and there. No, there will be nothing like that. What you'll be doing is one great big W-H-E-W. Whew. I'm getting in. But how? By grace, through faith, in the finished work of Christ. I'm so thankful for Jesus. Amen? Then death and Hades, oh, and it goes on to say, having to answer for their sins without the forgiveness only Christ can offer, they're all judged according to their works and they're cast into the lake of fire. If you're not in the book of life, you're cast then and there into the lake of fire. People say, why would God throw somebody into a lake of fire like that? He doesn't. You do. Because you have a choice. I had a choice. People have a choice. And if you miss Christ and you go into eternity without him, your choice. It's your choice. Amen? Then, Verse 14, death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. That's the second death. What's the second death? These people died twice. The ones that are cast in the lake of fire. They died first time in their sin. They died the second time after judgment. That's the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. How frightening. What a, how, can there be a more sobering verse than that? So why do we preach the gospel? Because of this right here. Why do we offer Christ all the time in many different ways in this church? 
because of these passages, what is coming for those who miss him. Now, how many of you are ready for it to get good? Let's see how far we can go tonight. Jumping into chapter 21, I'm going to go to verse 2 first. Then I, John, saw the holy, holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepare as a bride adorned for her husband. So after this horrible judgment, John sees a city. Everybody say a city. After this horrible judgment, John sees a city. And it's coming down out of heaven. Sounds to me like it's kind of floating down. He calls it the new Jerusalem. And that's distinct from the earthly Jerusalem. And it's where the redeemed, you and I, are going to dwell forever. It's the promised creation of a new heaven and a new earth. Can you say with me, new heaven? <clears throat> new earth. Now, what does that mean? Well, a new heaven and a new earth is repeated in prophecy all through the Bible. Let me give you some examples. Isaiah 65, verse 17. I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. 2 Peter 3.13, but in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. You catch that? I know, I know there's a lot of information here. <clears throat> but look what the Bible is saying. If there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, then the old earth and the old heaven are going away. The new heaven and the new earth, the heavenly Jerusalem, is called the bride. Its builder and maker is God. It's the Lamb's wife, the holy city, the holy Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. Jesus called it my Father's house, the city of the living God, and the city of rejoicing. This glorious city is presented as a bride adorned for her husband. It is spotless and magnificent. And folks, listen, this is where you're going. This is what Jesus was talking about in John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You believe in God, you believe also in me. In my Father's house, Father's house, are many mansions. That's the new Jerusalem. That's the new heavenly city. So what happens to the old heaven and the old earth? I'm going to tell you and then I'm going to finish tonight. I'm going to wrap it up after this, but I want you to catch this. Because if there's going to be a new everything, what happens to the old? Peter tells us. 2 Peter 3.10. Now I've taken the liberty. This is sort of the revised Wickwire amplified version of this verse. Because I took some of the words and pulled the meaning from the Greek and I just put it in parentheses so I can kind of uh, make it real to you. So here's what Peter says, 2 Peter 3, verse 10. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord means when everything ends. Will come like a thief in the night without warning. In which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The Greek, rushing sound or roar. And the elements... Literally, the building blocks of matter will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up with intense heat. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, this one was powerful in the original language. Watch this. Dissolved is from a word meaning literally the atoms will be untied from their cohesion to each other. We know that as an atomic blast kind of thing. In other words, the earth will fly apart. What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness in light of this? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, atoms will fly apart, 
being on fire with intense heat, and the elements, the building blocks of matter, will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, what do we look for? Say it with me. New heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Amen. Who's going to be in that new Jerusalem? I close here. God the Father will be there. Jesus will be there. Hallelujah. Abraham will be there. Daniel, Isaiah, David, John, Peter. Ready? Loved ones that went before you will be there. Twelve apostles will be there. The Twelve tribes of Israel will be there. Many mansions will be there. Will you be there? Do you know Christ? This is where you're headed. The captain's going to get you there. Can we stand up? You know, you think about the earth being burned up, and, and it says all the works in it. What a blessing that is. Think, all the pornography. It'll be all burned up. All of the sorcery, witchcraft, wicked books, and terrible sinful things that are on this earth, it's all going to be burned up. And God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth and a glorious city, streets of gold. Amen. Can we lift our hands to the Lord? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that this old world is winding down. But Lord, you've got a better plan. A brand new world is coming, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And Lord, we thank you for this incredible glimpse into what is coming. Help us, Lord, to live holy lives obedient lives submitted and yielded lives and Christ glorifying lives knowing that this is all coming soon and very soon let's worship let's just sing one chorus lift your hands up let's bless you Count your bones your heart will cry these bones will say great are you Lord? Oh, all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you Lord? It's your breath. Let's sing it now. Thank you, Lord. It's your Lord. breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. We pour out our praise to you, Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Thank you, Lord. Don't you kind of want to take somebody with you to that place we saw tonight? Amen. Bring somebody who needs Jesus. This Sunday. They may get saved. Think about your neighbor, your friend, your co-worker, your family members. Think of what is coming and invite them because they're as far away from God as a prayer. Amen? So I'm looking forward to sharing the Word of God with you this Sunday, and we're going to worship, bring somebody that needs the Lord, bring somebody that needs a church, get out there and be evangelistic. Let me just pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, bless the house of God tonight. And Lord, thank you for your blessing, your face shining on us, going out with the grace of God, the favor of God, and the anointing of God to be an influence for God in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a good night. Thank you for coming.